The gas can I found in the bunker would match this outline perfectly. Candid photos of the entire Armstrong family? A reporter just doing his job. Or something else? Clark's press card, and the phone number of the newspaper is on it. Ah, good. I can give them a call. Hmm. The glove compartment is closed. Huh. <laughs> Car keys and the sun visor. A classic hiding place. Well, at least on TV. The vehicle registration is not in the name of Michael Clark or a rental company. Clark's driver's license seems to be in order. Telephoto lens. Not so surprising for a journalist. Detective gets it right. Hi, I'm Detective Joanna Locke, Berkshire Police. I'd like to speak to an editor, please. One moment, please. Hello, Detective Locke? This is Abby Wilson. I'm a senior editor. What can I do for you? Does a man named Michael Clark work for you? Yes, he does. Why? When was the last time you heard from him? Oh. It's been at least seven or eight months. That's not unusual. 
he works in the field? Yes, Michael Clark is what we call a stringer. He works as a freelancer, comes up with a story we can use, we pay him, and we don't hear from him again for several months. What kind of stories does Mr. Clark write? Mr. Clark is an investigative reporter, mostly crime stories, to tell you the truth. He comes up with some pretty macabre stuff some of the time. Is there a problem? Or a story? Do you remember what the last case he investigated was? It was a murder case. The victim was a millionaire named James Miller. He was called the Frozen Fish King of Gloucester, Massachusetts. His body turned up in one of his nets. Or, rather, most of it did. Ah, well. Thank you, Ms. Wilson. You've been a great help to me. Pleasure. I hope he's not in trouble. He can be a little pushy, but he's a good guy overall. So what's he working on now, detective? Are you sitting on a story? Thanks again. I know my rights. You can't keep somebody locked up in a car like this, you know. You wouldn't do it if I was a dog. Do they have bathrooms at the station? I have the right to make a phone call, Detective whatever your name is. That phone is an outside line. Hello, boss. It's Michael Clark. I'm still on the Armstrong kidnap, but there's a small problem. I got caught being someplace I shouldn't be. I'm at the police station. No, I'm not under arrest. Just questioning. Fire me. Why? The station's integrity? You're kidding me, right? If you think I've screwed up that badly, then fire me. Got that? Fire me. Yes, do it. That didn't go well. I think I got my point across. What happens now? Go ahead. Then we'll have a chat. An extra computer so I don't have to go all the way out to my desk. This is all a game to him, and he doesn't expect to lose. Case files. A lot of them for our tiny town. The only comfortable chair in the whole station. But there's no time to rest. I'll add these to the file. Anything that will erase Clark's smile. Now that we've taken your DNA, we can begin. Interview of suspect Michael Clark, 6 p.m., March 30th, 2019. This interview is being recorded. By elves behind the mirror, no doubt? You were arrested at a crime scene where you damaged police barricade tape. I'll pay for a new roll. That's a Class A misdemeanor, and it carries a $500 fine. Oh, that's unfortunate. To begin with, where were you on the night Daisy Armstrong was kidnapped? I was watching TV in my motel room but I had my police scanner on. I heard the first reports that the little girl was missing. No way the police at the scene were gonna let me get close. 
I set my alarm so I could get on the story first thing in the morning and tried to sleep. It was difficult. Can anybody confirm where you were? No, afraid not. I was alone and sleepless. A sad combination. And I realize a bad alibi. You say you're a journalist, a stringer for Channel 6 News in Boston. I sell my stuff to lots of media outlets. Your camera was in your pickup. You didn't want to take pictures of the crime scene? I like to get the lay of the land. Once I see the story I want to tell, then I start documenting it. I don't know any journalist who works a case without their camera close at hand. He thinks he's invincible. I need to play his ego. That's the key. What are you doing in the Berkshires? And what is your connection to the Armstrong case? For the past few months, I've been working on a big case. Boston 6 News was looking forward to my next story. The Armstrongs have been on my list of potential targets for a long time. I changed gears when Daisy was kidnapped and started investigating the Armstrongs. It won't be easy to prove he's lying. Find some evidence. You're a better detective than that. I need proof, not guesswork. So you just stumbled on a major kidnapping story during your stay in the Berkshires? Yeah, I was researching PCBs in the river for crying out loud. Then, wow, the Armstrongs. That's not a Science Sunday report. That's a lead. Sometimes you just get lucky. Your camera in the pickup. There were photos of Daisy from before she was kidnapped. The Armstrongs are a famous family like the Kennedys or Hollywood couples. Gossip sites love them. People want to see how they live. I started out just stealing candid shots. Paparazzi live on getting that one exclusive shot. Steamy intimate, whatever. Then when the kidnapping happened, I realized I was here first. What an opportunity. And I jumped at it. You have an answer for everything. You're not very good at this, are you? How long have you been on the job? Long enough to put you away for life. If you killed that little girl. Let's move on to the gas cans and what we found in your pockets when you were brought in here today. That sounds exciting. In addition to the gasoline in the back of your pickup and another in the bunker, you had a lighter and gloves in your pockets. You were going to set fire to the bunker and every scrap of evidence inside. Where to begin? I'm sorry to disappoint you, but I wasn't planning to use these things to destroy the crime scene. I've been around crime scenes my entire career. I brought the gloves so as not to contaminate it with my fingerprints. The gas can in the back of my pickup, I use it to put gas in the truck. Gas stations are few and far between in your mountains. I didn't know there was a gas can in the bunker. If that's true, I did you a favor. My arrival obviously scared off somebody planning to burn everything. Do you also have an excuse for your lighter? The lighter? I'm trying to quit smoking. I use the lighter as a reminder not to start again.
Let's start with why you went to the cabin. If the police were interested in it, I was interested in it. How did you find the cabin? Police radio. I heard the forensic team getting directions. Then, when they finally left the scene late this morning, I jumped in my pickup and hurried on up the mountain. You tore the tape at the entrance to the property and stomped all over the house. This constitutes a serious violation of a crime scene, Mr. Clark. I'm aware of that. I'm sorry. I'll pay the fine. But I got carried away. It isn't often I get a crime scene all to myself. He's enjoying himself. I need to throw him off balance somehow. Surprise him into making an error. Explain to me again how you got to the crime scene. I listened in on the police radio frequency. Anybody can do it with a scanner. I headed for the crime scene in my trusty pickup, like I've done for years. After the forensic team left, I needed to see the crime scene for myself. I got to the bunker just before you arrived. I don't see anything that proves he's lying. Come on, Joanna. You're a better detective than that. It won't be easy to prove he's lying. Find some evidence. You said you've been driving that pickup for years? You heard right. Thanks to it, I never miss a story. You say you've been using your pickup for years, but the title certificate is not in your name. The truck belongs to somebody named Stephen Baker. Okay, I don't get why the pickup is so important to you, but I guess my ego made me say that. Yeah, the pickup was lent to me by a friend. I couldn't afford it even with a loan. I think you stole it. Mr. Clark, you needed a pickup like that for our mountain roads, so you stole that one. Try proving it. But while you run off on some wild goose chase, you can't hold me. I know that Clark is lying. I need to reconstruct the whole sequence of events in order to understand what happened. Score. One for the good guys. I'll tell you what really happened. You waited until forensics left and arrived in your probably stolen pickup. You grabbed a can of gasoline from your truck. You then went into the cabin to check if Daisy had been found. You then went straight to the bunker 
to see if it had been discovered, planning to set it on fire and destroy all the evidence inside. Before you could start the fire, you heard me arrive. So you hastily left your gas can and closed the hatch. You didn't think I could open the bunker. If I hadn't found you, I expect you would have burned down the cabin too. I'm not going to make fun of you, detective, or how you handled my interrogation. You're obviously very new at this. I swear I'm telling the truth. I didn't know the bunker was there until the moment you showed up. I seem to have trumped your entire police force. When I get the DNA results from the bunker, we'll continue this conversation. You have no concrete evidence against me whatsoever. The lab results will be in soon. You won't get away with this. See that call? That's your arrest warrant and a one-way ticket to prison. I'll be right back. Hello, sir. I think I found the man who kidnapped Daisy Armstrong. I'm interrogating him now. Hold on, Detective Luck. I have some bad news. Someone set fire to the cabin in the bunker. The fire department is on the scene, but they say it's too late. Th that's impossible. My suspect has been in the interrogation room with me all evening. We can't hold him. Suzanne Moreau. Her fingerprints are on the wine bottle found in the cabin. We also found an unknown person's fingerprints, but they don't match your suspects. Sir, with all due respect, I'm convinced Michael Clark is involved. Detective, I'm cutting you some slack already. But we cannot hold your suspect simply because you're convinced he's guilty. We have evidence that Suzanne was working with an accomplice, Noah Garrity. I order you to release the reporter and arrest this Moreau. L let me just check my last lead. The DNA analysis of the hair found in the bunker safe. The results just came in. I know how hard this is. I... Okay. Get the DNA results. Detective Locke, I will give you one hour maximum. Then you close the file and arrest Suzanne Moreau. Thank you, sir. Who did you call earlier? An editor from the Boston Six News. An editor you repeatedly said should fire you. That was your accomplice, wasn't it? You were telling him to start the fire. An accomplice? I know it was Noah you called. I'm saying nothing more without the presence of my lawyer. Stay right where you are. I'm not done with you yet. Wow. Do I hear grounds for a lawsuit? Some poor, innocent woman is being accused instead of you. You set her up, didn't you? You have to let me go, detective. All I need is one more phone call to the lab. I know it's you, and I'm going to prove it. Hello, this is Joanna Locke. I need the results of the DNA test I asked you for. Hi, detective. Sorry, we only have the DNA sequence. We haven't had time to compare it with the suspects yet. It'll take seven more hours. I'm sorry, but you are not the only one on the waiting list. Send your analysis to my computer in the office. I'll do the comparison myself. I need authorization. I have a murderer who is going to walk free unless I get those results now. Fine, we'll send it to you right away, but I'll have to log this. It's my last chance.
Oh, no, no, Suzanne. I don't understand. I was sure it would be Clark's hair. I'll have to let him go. You can leave. Sorry it didn't work out for you, detective. Maybe you should consider a career change. We are not done. Oh, but we are, my dear. We are done. I had no choice but to return to the Armstrong house to arrest Suzanne Moreau. The arrest warrant for Suzanne Moreau. Suzanne was set up by Clark and Noah. They are the kidnappers, but I'm not giving up. When Suzanne comes up for trial, I will fight for her defense. But for now, the district attorney is in charge. If I want to stay a detective, he always has the last word. Hmm, the door is wide open. How strange. Hey, is anyone there? Miss Moreau? Miss Moreau? This is Detective Locke. Miss Moreau, can you hear me? It's me, Detective Locke. You must get up now. Miss Moreau? Miss Moreau, can you hear me? Suzanne Moreau is dead. There are no traces of blows or injuries on her body. She doesn't seem to have defended herself from anyone. It appears Suzanne killed herself by ingesting all these drugs. It appears Suzanne killed her... Glasses are missing. Suzanne's diary is missing. Suzanne was telling the truth about her mother.
She must have realized at last how she'd been used. The death of her mother would have been an additional shock, and the self-righteous court of social media was as quick as usual to try and convict her. I called the district attorney to inform him. This is Detective Locke, sir. I'm at the Armstrong house. Have you arrested Suzanne Moreau? She's dead, sir. Apparent suicide, but I need a forensics team. She killed herself out of remorse for her part in the crime? We don't know that yet. I'm calling forensics now, but I wanted you to know. What a mess. Stay on site until forensics arrive. Yes, sir. Standing by. The investigation was officially closed. I was certain that she was innocent, and Clark had been responsible for four deaths and then vanished into thin air with a million dollars. Dollars marked, though, and not easily spent. I didn't care if the case was officially closed. I swore, Mr. Poirot, whatever it took, I would hunt him down. I waited for the forensics team, then went into the station to write my report. I was officially off the case. Thank you, mademoiselle. That obviously cannot be the completion of your story. If I might ask a question? Of course. Suzanne Moreau's boyfriend, the one who manipulated her and burned down the cabin, this was Ratchet? No, he was an accomplice. Clark, the phony journalist, was the leader. Michael Clark, the reporter, he was Ratchet? Absolutely. I was the only law enforcement official to question Clark. I knew this wasn't his first kidnapping. You looked for similar cases. What do you Americans call the MMOs? Means, motive, and opportunity. Yes, I looked for someone in plain sight. Someone on the edge of a kidnapping case. Someone in plain view, keeping track of the investigations. An innocent witness, a concerned neighbor, even another reporter. And eventually you found a name behind an alias. Yes, I found a name. Cassetti, the real name. The real name of the man you call Ratchet is Cassetti. This explains much, mademoiselle, but not all. It explains why she is our number one suspect. But not how she came to be on this train. Attends, she has grown pale. I, I don't know... what's wrong with me. Excuse me, Mr. Poirot. I don't feel very well. You are exhausted and still feeling the effects of the drug. Stay with us, mademoiselle. One more effort. I need to know your recent movements. I snuck aboard the train. This I observed. You came directly to this room? Yes. Yes, and other than a couple of careful trips to the... the ladies yesterday, I never left this room. I didn't want to be spotted by Ratchet. Yesterday, I, I chatted with my roommate, Miss Schmidt, I think, here in our room. She brought me some dinner. I got very sleepy and nodded off. And now she nods off again. Is this a joke? She must be faking so we can't interrogate her further, Poirot. No, Book. She really seems to have fallen asleep again. It is my fault. She must have been given a dangerous dose of sleeping pills last night. The effects should wear off soon, I hope, but I am afraid asking her to tell us her story was too much for her. Pinch her, Poirot. She's faking. Her eyes are dilated. She is not faking, and there will be no pinching. Dr. Constantine, please stay with her. Monsieur Book, ask the other passengers to gather in the dining car. There are still many questions I need to ask. But all of them together? 
Won't someone overhear your questioning the others? I will speak softly because I am trained to do so. They will speak softly because they want to. Very well. I will do as you say. I hope we will be leaving soon. I hope we will be leaving soon. I should go and interview the passengers in the restaurant car. I should go and interview the passengers in the restaurant car. The passengers who agreed to come and talk to you are assembled, Poirot. Mr. Masterman is already here to answer your questions. Perfect. Thank you, my friend. Sit down, Mr. Masterman, please. Thank you. Does the name Cassetti mean anything to you? No. Should it? Have you heard of the Armstrong kidnapping case? Of course. It was all over the news a few years ago. Your employer's real name is Cassetti. He was the man behind that kidnapping. Mr. Ratchet was... He murdered that poor little girl? Mr. McQueen, the man you worked for is a kidnapper named Cassetti. What? <laughs> what kidnapping? He murdered his victim, a child named Daisy Armstrong. The Armstrong kidnapping? You had no idea of Monsieur Ratchet's real name? Damn, skunk! Why are you so upset? My father was the district attorney who handled the case, Mr. Poirot. I saw Mrs. Armstrong more than once. She was a lovely woman, so gentle and heartbroken. If ever a man deserved what he got, Ratchet, or Cassetti, is the man. He didn't deserve to live. Madame Olson, have you heard of the Daisy Armstrong case? No, I've never heard of it. It was only two years ago. It was famous. Maybe so, but it was not famous in Spain, where I have been helping the refugees from Africa. You've never heard the name Daisy Armstrong? No, never. Daisy Armstrong? No. No. No! No! Yes. It was all over the English tabloids before I went to Jordan. A horrific crime that claimed the lives of an entire family and their wrongfully accused nanny. That's right, isn't it? Quite so. I thought the culprit had been punished. Some might say that the culprit was punished last night. Oh, my heavens. May I ask you a few more questions? Yes. Yes, of course. You read about the crime, as you said, in the tabloids. Yes, that's right. For weeks, news of the royal family was eclipsed. Have you ever been to the United States, mademoiselle? No, never. Jordan was really my first trip abroad. You were in Jordan? Yes, I was an English tutor there to the children of a high official. Until recently. What is your relationship to Captain Arbuthnot? Who? A former soldier traveling with us. You must have met him. Ah oh, yes, I met him on the platform in Istanbul. We only had a brief exchange of pleasantries, nothing more. British Reserve and all that. Ah, the British Reserve. Yes, with this I am familiar. <laughs> Are you 
you sure everything you have told me is accurate, Mademoiselle Debenham? Of course. Mademoiselle, I know that you met Captain Arbuthnot at the Tocatlion Hotel. You were spying on me. I am very attentive to my surroundings. It helps in my profession. I... well, it's your word against mine. I had occasion to be of some assistance in recovering Captain Arbuthnot's train ticket. While searching his room, I also discovered one of your earrings. Whatever your relationship may be to the good captain, I doubt it has anything to do with British Reserve. Hmm. You will not tell me your secret, mademoiselle? I... I can't. I... I don't know what you mean. Poirot, Miss Debenham's got nothing to do with this business. Nothing. Do you hear? Archie, stop! Captain, no! This behavior is unworthy of an officer and a gentleman. Leave her alone! Have you no honor? Archie, we should go. Captain Arbuthnot, I am certain you are a brave soldier, but you are a poor actor. The truth is that Your relationship with Miss Debenham is beyond doubt, Captain. Your reaction was apparently that of a man trying to protect the woman he loves. I might understand that if your relationship were some cleverly disguised secret, but it is not. You make puppy dog eyes at one another at every opportunity. You cannot hide your love. Everybody knows. I advise you to stop with your accusations, Mr. Poirot. I'm going to escort Miss Debenham back to her compartment. Make of that what you will. The captain and Mademoiselle Debenham are obviously adamant about not revealing their relationship, but this scene convinced me there is more that is not so obvious. This murder has everyone on edge. In my 25-year career, I have never seen such madness aboard the Orient Express. I understand, my friend. The more we learn, the more perplexing this train ride becomes. But we have other clues to pursue. What do you have in mind? The broken watch on Monsieur Ratchet's wrist, for example. And the handkerchief found near the body. Who does that belong to? This little drama we have just witnessed has not put you off the scent. Far from it, my friend. Will you return to your watch over Mademoiselle Locke? Yes, I will. Dr. Constantine can probably use a break. Good. Au revoir, Poirot. That's the right answer.
I do not think that's the right answer. This is wrong, but I'm never far from the truth. My little grey cells did not let me down. Enchanté, mademoiselle. You are Hildegard Schmidt? I am Lafol. And you, I know, are Herr Poirot. Correct. May I ask you for a few minutes of your time to answer a few questions? With pleasure, but uh, first may I ask for your help? <laughs> Why does this not surprise me? I... I don't know. I am at your service, Fraulein. My mistress, Princess Dragomirov, has asked me to open this traditional matryoshka doll. There is a trinket inside she must retrieve. Madam, in my experience, each Russian nesting doll simply pulls apart to reveal the next one inside. Indeed. Yet try it for yourself. As you wish. Oh, you are a gentleman.
the inscription reads, To my dearest friend. Ah, oh, thank you very much. This doll reminds her of her youth in Russia. It was very hard under the Soviet regime, but thanks to her strength of will, she rose to be the head of a museum of antiquities in St. Petersburg. Even though she now lives in Berlin, it is said that... The Kremlin still fears her. She must be a formidable woman indeed. You are her maid? I am her companion. I help her in her daily tasks, and I keep her company. Ah, forgive me. You will have heard of Ratchet's murder last night. Yes, of course. Everyone is talking about it. Have you lost a handkerchief embroidered with an H, madame? Oh, no, monsieur. I thought perhaps since your first name is Hildegard. It is not mine, I tell you. I could not afford something so nice. I have no idea who it belongs to. My apologies. I did not mean to alarm you. Have you lost a hand? Oh, no, monsieur. I it is not. I have no. My. Thank you for answering my questions, madame. Think, Poirot, that is not a good answer. Hmm. Let me consider all the possibilities. Yes, there are only three possible hypotheses. The watch has been tampered with, or it is out of adjustment, or it indicates the time of the murder. I shall explore these last two possibilities before reaching any conclusion. If the watch is out of adjustment, it may be broken. There may also be another reason related directly to Ratchet. Maybe the watch is set to another time zone. My little grey cells did not let me down. I do not think that's the right answer. No, 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 not good. Think, Poirot, that is not a good answer. The watch was not defective because the second hand is still moving. I'm right again. That happens to me a lot. If this theory is correct, then the murder took place at 12.15 a.m. I must interrogate all the passengers to see if any of them have an alibi for this hour.
et voilà. Monsieur, I am Hercule... I know who you are, Monsieur Poirot. What do you want? Answers to a simple question or two. All right, but quickly. My wife is quite ill. I would like to stay by her side. I promise. First of all, I imagine you know about the murder. Of course. The Countess is terribly distressed. Your full name? Rodolphe Adreni. Your home is... Budapest. And how do you come to be aboard the Orient Express? I am a Hungarian diplomat. My family has represented our homeland since the revolution from the Soviet Union in 1956. I was on my country's business in Istanbul. Business which I cannot discuss. And your wife often accompanies you on your diplomatic missions? Yes, and why not? Was there anything else you wanted to know? I'm right again. That happens to me a lot. Can you tell me how you spent last night? I was in our compartment with my wife. She went to bed early. I... I played a video game on my phone. Around 11 o'clock in the evening, my wife woke up and couldn't get back to sleep. She took a sleeping pill. As for me, I went to bed soon after that and slept straight through until morning. Have you ever been to the United States? I was posted to the Hungarian embassy in Washington for a year. You knew, perhaps, the Armstrong family? Armstrong? Armstrong. It is difficult to recall. One meets so many people. It was the kidnapping of a child, a very sad affair. The culprit was the man on this train who called himself Ratchet, the one who was murdered last night. Indeed. It sounds like justice finally caught up with him. Thank you for your time. Now, I'd like to speak to your wife, if you don't mind. It's impossible. As I told you, my wife is very ill. Thank you, and good luck with the investigation. Eh bien, the good Count does not appear to want me to talk to his wife. Monsieur, if I am to catch this murderer, I will need your help. My help? I am at your service, Poirot. You are very protective of your wife, Count Andrény. Does that surprise you? A vertigo can be very dangerous. I believe there are many kinds of vertigo. If you don't mind, I'd rather talk to a doctor, not a detective. If you'd excuse me. I would like to speak to Countess Andrény, please. As I have already told you, she is in no condition to speak to you. Monsieur le Comte, I am investigating a murder. I wish you every success, but my wife is too frail to be questioned. Monsieur, if I am to catch this murderer, I will need your help. My help? I am at your service, Poirot. You are obviously a devoted husband, Count Andrini. My wife means the world to me. There were questions in Budapest about a Hungarian diplomat marrying an American woman. It did not deter you. I would have given up my position for her. I would think it is universal. Are you married, Mr. Poirot? No. I fear marriage is not for me. But... 
Her condition, is it very grave? She is suffering about a vertigo. You understand? The room spins. I think Dr. Constantine could help your wife. There is a doctor on this train? I did not know. Where is this doctor? I think Dr. Constantine is in the lounge car. If not, perhaps the conductor can tell you where he is. Very well, I will find him. Thank you very much. Forgive me for intruding, madame. I am Hercule Poirot. I know who you are, Mr. Poirot. I overheard you send my husband on a wild goose chase. Your husband cares for you greatly, madame. I apologize for exploiting that fact. But the situation is urgent, and I need to ask you a few questions. Apology accepted. I realize you must speak to everyone. This horrendous murder. It's very upsetting. That is a beautiful music box. Please don't touch the music box. It's a fragile family heirloom. Your accent, is it American? Boston, perhaps? You have a good ear, Mr. Poro. Yes. Born and raised in what we call the Back Bay. Are you in the diplomatic service like your husband? No, not officially. I was still in college when I met Rudy two years ago. I keep myself busy handling his scheduling. Travel, appointments. Ah, what is this saying? Behind every great man there is a great woman. That was the saying. Today one might reverse the sentiment as well, don't you think? Of course, I stand corrected. I must admit I'm not right this time. I do not think that's the right answer. No, 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 not good. My little gray cells did not let me down. A handkerchief embroidered with an H was found at the crime scene. By any chance, does your first name begin with an H? No, my first name is Elena, with an E. Hmm. Can you tell me what you did last night? Well, my husband and I went to dinner. Then we came back here. We went to bed around 10 o'clock. I tried to sleep, but I couldn't because of the shaking of the train. I suffer from vertigo. I finally took a sleeping pill and that did the trick. When did the train's motion prevent you from sleeping? Between midnight and 2 a.m. I know because I must have looked at my watch about 10 times. Hmm, I see. Calm now, Countess. You are not telling me the truth. Why do you say that? The train stopped at 12.30 a.m. due to snow. So there was no shaking of the train. But you told me that it was the shaking that prevented you from sleeping. I don't know. You're confusing me. My vertigo. Madame. A man died last night. You can't talk nonsense just because you're sick. You are hiding something from me. How dare you! I didn't do anything wrong. I'm going to find my husband. Uh, 
That was unkind, I know, but my strategy worked. I can now inspect this room in peace. These must be the sleeping pills that Countess Andreni took last night. There seems to be something missing here. An engraving written in, I believe, Russian Cyrillic. It looks like a first name.
an engraving. For my beautiful young ladies, Helena and Sonia. Helena with an H. It's Countess Andreni with an older girl. Poirot! Have you no shame? Monsieur, I am afraid shame is not a very helpful emotion for a detective trying to get at the truth. What are you doing in our compartment? I am investigating a murder, Count Andreni. My wife is ill. My apologies, monsieur, but your wife seemed in perfect health when she left the room to find you. I do apologize, but I needed to search your compartment. You will regret this, Poirot. Please, Count. You aren't going to challenge me to a duel, are you? Countess, I'm afraid I took the liberty of inspecting your little music box. How dare you! The message in the medallion was addressed to you and Sonia. Sonia Armstrong, your older sister, the mother of Daisy, the murdered child. I am a Hungarian diplomat. You have no official standing here. You have no right to search- No, Rudolf. Let me speak. It's useless to deny what this gentleman says. I am Helena Goldenberg, the sister of Sonia Armstrong, and Daisy was my niece. The music box is a gift from my sister's godmother, a very close friend to my mother. We hid the truth from you when we learned that the man killed last night was the person who destroyed my family. I panicked. I didn't want to be accused. That is also why you lied about the H in your first name? Exactly. Your ferreting about looking for the H is obviously part of your investigation. If I found a anchor chief in Monsieur Ratchet's room embroidered with an H, I might suspect you had been there. A handkerchief? I don't have any handkerchiefs embroidered with my initial. To be honest, that sounds awfully old-fashioned to me. I give you my word of honor that last night, Helena never left her compartment. My wife is telling you the truth, Poirot. I hope so. I'll let you rest. The matter of the age on the anchor chief still needs clearing up. But first, I should check the inscription on the back of the medallion. Natalia Dragomirov. She is the only Russian passenger on the train. In addition, her first name begins with an H in Cyrillic. I'm right again. That happens to me a lot. Madame Hubbard, may I ask you a question or two? It won't take long. Anything I can do to help. Have you misplaced a handkerchief recently? No, I don't think so. Why? We found a handkerchief embroidered with the letter H, so I thought it might have been yours. I'm sorry, but it's not. It may belong to Miss Schmidt, Princess Dragomirov's lady's maid. 
I believe her first name is Hildegard. It is a possibility. Anyone could be lying, of course. I thank you, madame. Hello. Can I do something for you? Hello, Monsieur Hardman, I believe. You have heard of the murder? Cyrus Hardman, yes. And the fact that there's been a murder is all over the train. You do not seem very concerned about it, Monsieur. It's not the first murder I've run across. I had no idea the selling of toys was so dangerous. I did overhear you mention at dinner that this is your profession. Toy salesman is a cover. I'm a private detective, just like you from the U.S. No, 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 not good. Et voilà. I did not expect to find another detective on this train. I just finished a job in Istanbul when I received an email from Rashid. He hired me to protect him. Something you failed to do. I'm not happy about that. He'd received some threatening letters. I was supposed to watch his back, and yeah, something I failed to do. But he seemed to think he was in more danger when he left the train. He was traveling to Paris? I assume so, but I'm not entirely sure. Can anyone on this train confirm your identity? Yeah, that McQueen kid. Ratchet's secretary. Were you on duty last night? You bet. I kept my door open a crack and I watched all night. No one entered that car who didn't belong there. Did you see anything in particular? The conductor, Michelle. He was there most of the time, too, except for 15 minutes or so after we left Vinkovsky. He must have answered a call from Ratchet's room, then he was absent again for a while around 1 a.m. After that, he didn't move until 5. Monsieur Hardman, have you heard of the Armstrong case? Armstrong? A kidnapping three or four years ago? Who hasn't? Why? Ratchet's real name was Cassetti. I have reason to believe he was the kidnapper. What? He killed that little girl? No, I didn't know. If I had known, I wouldn't have taken the job. Do you have any idea who was behind the threatening letters? I don't know his name, but Ratchet told me he was a small man. Dark hair, with a womanish kind of voice. Oh. Thank you for your help. Uh, is this handkerchief embroidered with an H yours? Do I look like the kind of guy who would use a handkerchief like that? <laughs> Thank you for answering my questions, Monsieur Ardman. Listen, Poirot. I know I fell down on the job, but if you need help, any at all, let me know. I'd like to make it right. Ah. It has been a while since I have seen one of those. I am not prepared to receive anyone. Come back later. I'm sorry, madame, but a man has been murdered. I must ask you a few questions. You must have misunderstood me. I cannot speak to you just now. Madame, I know that Sonia Armstrong is your goddaughter. 
Come in, please. Please forgive my intrusion, madame, but I really must ask you some questions. Then ask. I'll answer if it pleases me. Hmm, we have not been properly introduced, yet I have observed her a couple of times, so I can already deduce some things about her. That was easy. I will first ask you about last night. Will you tell me your movements? I went to bed just after dinner. I read until 11, then tried to sleep. Later I woke. What caused you to awaken? I suffer from back pain, a consequence of old age interfering with an active life. I called Schmidt around 12.45 a.m. to give me a massage. She did so until I fell asleep. How long was she with you? A good hour, I would say. I see. The first initial of your first name, Natalia, in the Cyrillic alphabet looks exactly like the letter H in the Latin alphabet. I'm Russian, Monsieur Poirot, and I was the head of a museum of antiquities in St. Petersburg for decades until I moved to Berlin recently. <laughs> I'm familiar with Cyrillic. This handkerchief is yours, isn't it? Uh, yes, indeed. I lost it. It was found in Monsieur Ratchet's room. Can you explain to me why Madame Schmidt didn't identify the handkerchief? She must have known it was yours. Possibly to protect me. She is very loyal. Your next question will be, how did my handkerchief come to be lying by a murdered man's body? My reply to that is that I have no idea. That is not an answer, madame. It is all I am able to give you. I must tell you, Princess Dragomirov, I have discovered something astonishing. And that is? You are Sonia Armstrong's godmother. You make that sound like a revelation. I have never hidden the fact, monsieur. You knew Colonel Armstrong well, then? I knew him slightly. But his wife, Sonia Armstrong, was my goddaughter. I was on terms of friendship with her mother, the actress Linda Arden. Linda Arden was a genius, one of the greatest tragic actresses in the world. I was not only an admirer of her art, I was a personal friend. Very well. But this links you to the Armstrong kidnapping case. Helena Andreni is the sister of Sonia Armstrong, the late mother of Daisy Armstrong, kidnapped and killed by the man who was murdered on this train. Ratchet. Indeed. Was it he? Then justice has at last been served. Allow me to summarize. Do I have a choice? First coincidence, I shall call it. You are close to the Armstrong family, and the presumed assassin of Daisy Armstrong was killed while you were on board the same train. Second coincidence. Your handkerchief happens to be found at the foot of the victim's bed. Third coincidence. One of the stab wounds inflicted on the body was by a left-handed person. You are left-handed. That is a lot of coincidences, Princess Dragomirov. Well, Monsieur Poirot, call it fate. If you report to the police your coincidences, they will laugh. A woman of my age and frailty has violently murdered a man? With how many potential witnesses who saw me doddering along the corridor in the middle of the night like Lady Macbeth? You are right, Princess. You could not work alone. Which means you have one or more accomplices. And it is only a matter of time before I find out who they are. I would appreciate it if you would remove yourself from my room and take your fantasies with you. Ri 
Привет! 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 That's the right answer. 